As we get into social perspectives on literature and art, uh, you may ask yourself uh, out of idle curiosity or perhaps even peevishly, why Marx? Why so much Marx? Why is it Marx who seems to stand behind the idea that the social criticism of art is the best and most relevant way to approach this subject matter? Uh, well, it's because whatever the outcome of Marx's thought may have proven to be historically, it's nevertheless the case uh, to this day that the most devastating critique of existing ideas about things, of states of affairs that, uh, as it were, meander along without too much self-consciousness, remains the Marxist one, together perhaps with the Freudian one. And when uh, we turn to Jameson next time, we'll see that in both cases, and we'll be working a little bit with this today too when we turn to Benjamin, uh, we'll see that in both cases it has to do with the way in which um, we are brought up short by the kind of criticism which argues that somehow standing behind uh, our conception of reality and our understanding of our place in the world, there is one form or another of the unconscious. Uh, we have uh, arguably uh, in this course in literary theory first taken up notions of a linguistic uh, unconscious or in any case linguistic preconditioning, then taken up notions of a psychoanalytic unconscious, and now uh, in the very title of Jameson's book, from which we'll be considering an excerpt in the next lecture, uh, we have the notion of the political unconscious. There are other ways of effecting a social criticism of literature and art. Uh, from the right, uh, there's, the, there's an extraordinary book by Leo Strauss on Aristophanes, together with his great readings of the traditional texts of political philosophy. Uh, there is, of course, a very strong liberal tradition of criticism, uh, particularly in the public sphere, in the journalism of the public sphere. Uh, perhaps the most uh, notable proponent of a liberal uh, criticism of art undertaken from a social point of view is the work collected in Lionel Trilling's The, Literal, the Liberal Imagination. So there are options, but by far the most pervasive mode of social critique uh, in literary theory and in the modern history of thinking about literature uh, remains the Marxist one. Our concern, because we are uh, as much as we can be in working through these materials, our concern is, of course, primarily with Marxist aesthetics. What are the options uh, for a Marxist critic um, in aesthetic terms? Uh, and, that's, uh, and that's, of course, uh, what we're going to be taking up uh, in a moment and also when we turn to uh, Frederick Jameson on Thursday. But in the meantime, what about Marx? Uh, I mean, I, I, I think I can take it for granted uh, in a course of this kind. Most of you have some familiarity with the history of ideas uh, and with Western culture. I think I can take it for granted that, that, that most of you have some notion, just as you have some notion about Freud, uh, you have some notion of what Marx is all about, um, of particular importance for the kinds of criticism we undertake to read in this uh, moment of the course is, uh, of course, the idea of ideology. Uh, now, ideology in the writings of both Marx and Engels and in uh, all the, the sort of complex history uh, of the writings that have succeeded them, they were founders of discursivity uh, and there has been great debate within the Marxist tradition. Ideology is a term about which there has never been a wholehearted agreement. Primarily, the disagreement concerning ideology in this tradition has to do with whether or not uh, ideology ought properly to be, uh, to be ascribed to conscious as well as to unconscious 
uh, preconceptions about the world. In other words, if I know um, really to the core perfectly well that the moon is made of green cheese, uh, I can prove it. Uh, I have no doubt about it. It's not something that I'm unaware that I think. <laughs> then, of, and which, but at the same time, uh, if my opinion, my belief, my expression of fact uh, to the effect that the moon is, is made of green cheese um, can be uh, demystified as ideology, the question is: Well, is it still ideology if I'm quite conscious? <laughs> Of knowing that the moon is made of green cheese, and prepared to defend my position, uh, just as um, as a kind of belated aristocrat, I might be prepared to defend the idea that hierarchy and privilege is appropriate in society. Um, perfectly conscious that this is an unpopular idea, but nevertheless uh, fully committed to it and prepared to defend it. The question. Sometimes in Marxism is, is this still ideology? The answer by and large, particularly in the writings of Engels, perhaps more than in the writings of Marx, the, a, the answer by and large is, it is. Ideology is essentially the belief that perspective is truth. That is to say, the way in which things appear from the material and economically grounded standpoint of my own consciousness is not just the way they appear to me, but the way they actually are. Now, this is a mode of belief which, in various historical periods, according to Marx, has characterized each dominant class in turn. With the rise of capitalism, uh, it's uh, the, the, the evolution of capitalism into what's called late capitalism. Of course, the, this ideology is primarily what's called the bourgeois ideology. In other words, the idea that the various premises on which uh, bourgeois middle class existence is based, the premises that have allowed for the rise and appropriation of power of the middle class, the idea for example, of the work ethic, uh, the idea of family, the idea of certain forms of, 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 of moral behavior, all of this uh, is ideological insofar as it is supposed to be valid and equally the case for all, in all circumstances, at all historical times. In other words, the belief that what I see the world to be is just universally the way the world is. That is the general characterization of ideology. Now, we've seen this, of course. I mean, we began the course with uh, the quotation from Marx, from Marx's Capital on Commodity fetish Fetishism. We've seen this uh, in the way in which um, it is just spontaneously supposed, reflexively, without reflection, that the labor properties of something that's produced, that is to say the value that can accrue to it because of the amount of labor that's gone into it, is actually something that inheres in the product itself of labor. Uh, this, of course, applies as well to art, and it's something that Benjamin is fully aware of alluding to when he talks about the aura. If I forget that art is produced, that a certain quantum of labor, in other words, has gone into the, uh, the emergence of the work of art. And if I simply, in rapt contemplative uh, attention, uh, address myself to the work of art as itself as though it had objective value apart from having been produced in a mode of production, then what I'm doing is commodifying the work of art. From Benjamin's point of view, in other words, to be seduced by the aura of the work of art is, in a certain sense, to experience the work uh, of art ideologically as a commodity. All right, now, returning then to the whole question of the aesthetic uh, objectives uh, of. Marxist criticism. 
there are basically four options. In other words, Marxist criticism has not consistently agreed, uh, particularly in its sort of sophisticated uh, versions, has not consistently agreed about what the aesthetic of art ought actually to be. In other words, how should art reflect society? How should it constitute a critique of society? How should it predict an ideal, uh, uh, emergent, utopian society? Uh, all of these questions are questions of aesthetic, because the way in which art does uh, express the social is necessarily aesthetic. It's done through form. It's done through genre. It's done as a matter of style. It's done ultimately, as the Marxists would say, in this or that mode of production. And all of these mediations of, the, of what you might call the expression of society then are understood uh, as the aesthetic in Marxist thought uh, and, and need to be understood in terms of possible options. The aesthetic of Marx and Engels themselves was realist, but it was a kind of realist that was really rather sophisticated. When aspiring writers, already with the idea that they ought to be writing for the advancement of the proletariat, would write Engels – I'm thinking of Ferdinand LaSalle, uh, Minakotsky, other people would sort of send uh, Engels manuscripts of their sort of socialist realist novels, and Engels hated them. <laughs> he, just, he just couldn't stand uh, that kind of literature. And he said, no, 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 no. You don't have to, you, you, you don't have to glorify the proletariat. You, 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 don't have to, you, you don't have to project a future in this way. What you want to do is see in a way that exposes it the social dynamic as it exists. What you want to do is understand the world realistically but not tendentiously, that is to say, not from an open point of view. Engels' literary hero was Balzac, who was a royalist reactionary, but who nevertheless, in Engels' view, uh, was so brilliant in evoking society in all of its manifold complexities, particularly in the complexity of its class structure, that this was the model, uh, the appropriate model for people hoping to engage in the business of realist writing. Now, this was a mode of thought that prevailed largely in Marxists through its early energetic years, including the early energetic years of the Revolution itself. In 1927, the literary philosopher Georg Lukács, L-U-K-A-C-S, who had been a kind of Hegelian theorist of literature. He'd written a, a very brilliant book called The Theory of the Novel uh, before he turned to Marxist thought. Um, in 1927, still notice the same year in which Eichenbaum is writing his Theory of the Formal Method and the same year in which Benjamin visits Moscow. In other words, a period of real, continued, social and intellectual ferment, ferment within the framework of Marxist government, in 1927 wrote a book called The Historical Novel. And this book is as though it were taken from Engels' letters. It's partly an attack on what Lukács took to be the sort of narcissistic inwardness of high modernism, particularly Joyce and Proust. It's a tendentious attack uh, and certainly subject to criticism on all sorts of grounds. It's partly that, but it's also just in the way that Engels championed Balzac in his letters. It's a book that champions the novels of Sir Walter Scott. Scott, too, was a political reactionary, a Tory, but whose great sort of dialectical balances in his novels between Highland and Lowland, feudal and mercantile, Scotland and England, whose balances of uh, an old social order with an emerging social order, Lukács took to be perfect exemplifications 
of what realism, of seeing class relations as they really are, can do. And so this is the tradition of realist aesthetics in Marxist criticism. But then, as really dating from 1927 precisely, uh, with the rise of Stalin, uh, things began to change, at least in the Soviet sphere. And the original ideas of all these people who used to write to Engels, Minakotsky, Ferdinand Lassalle, uh, writers of that kind, began to prevail in Soviet thought. There was a literary critic named Zhnadov uh, who articulated uh, a doctrine of, Soviet, of, of socialist realism. Um, even, the, e even Marxist critics themselves in, in those days devised a, sort of a joke about the sort of novel that Zhnadov had in mind. Uh, you probably know the joke, uh, boy meets tractor, uh, boy loses tractor, boy goes to the city to find tractor, finds tractor, uh, continues to be in love, takes tractor back to the countryside, and lives happily ever after. Um, this fundamental plot, uh, obviously a variant on the marriage plot, uh, but very much engaged also in uh, what Benjamin would call the mechanical aspects of reproduction. Uh, <laughs> this, th 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 this sort of plot, as the characteristic plot of uh, socialist realism, uh, began to take hold officially so that um, in 1934, uh, the Soviet culture minister Bukharin uh, convened an international Soviet writers' conference in which it was simply decreed from on high that henceforth uh, literary practice would consist in uh, the promotion of an exemplification of socialist realism. Uh, and since then, really right up until uh, the fall of the Iron Curtain in 1989, since then uh, there really was a form of censorship uh, abroad uh, in Soviet and Soviet sphere societies uh, to the effect that uh, literature was subject to challenge, possibly to suppression, if, to suppression if it didn't adhere to uh, socialist realist tenets. So those are the forms of realism that I think are most often identified with Marxist criticism and its possibilities. But as a matter of fact, probably the most dynamic criticism since Lukács uh, of the 20th century has recognized that realism is something that after all, from a Marxist perspective, can easily be shown to have been commandeered by the bourgeoisie. Who else tells it like it is? Who else insists that reality is just one drink below par? Who else insists that, uh, that he or she is a realist other than the characteristic um, sort of middle class per, uh, person uh, who tells you that they've been there, done that, and know everything that there is to know? Uh, the middle class, in other words, from the standpoint of much Marxist thought since uh, Lukács, um, has uh, commandeered for itself, just as it commandeers everything else for itself, has commandeered for itself the idea of realism, which has therefore become, in these views, uh, outmoded aesthetically. Now, Benjamin is himself acutely conscious of this problem, and he insists uh, that uh, realism, uh, in a variety of ways, is uh, a kind of late capitalist uh, form of commodifying the aura. Uh, it, is, uh, it is the last gasp uh, of uh, bourgeois art in a variety of ways, he says hopefully, uh, and it needs to be counteracted with what he takes to be a participatory aesthetic, an aesthetic uh, of the fragment, an aesthetic of uh, intermittent attention, of um, participation which does not uh, nevertheless in, in any way involve a sense of persistingly uh, 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 contemplating that which is real, but, but emphasizes rather uh, the idea that one is oneself in a communal spirit engaged with the very mode of production of the work of art uh, and somehow or another involved in that. That's what we'll come back to 
when we turn to Benjamin's work of art essay. Perhaps the most unusual aesthetic move for a Marxist criticism, Marxist critic, is the one that you will find in Adorno. Adorno was devoted to precisely what Lukács had attacked in the historical novel, namely the high modernist aesthetic. He admired Beckett in literature. He admired Schoenberg, Berg, Webern in music. Uh, Adorno was by training a musicologist, and he devoted uh, much of his uh, writing career uh, to uh, producing essays and treatises on music and the history of music. Uh, these were heroes in Adorno's pantheon. And of course, the question arises, how can, how can these people who have nothing to say about society, uh, who are totally preoccupied with form, who seem to be indifferent to the whole course of history, how can these people uh, be the aesthetic heroes of a Marxist critic? Uh, this is something you see much more clearly in the fetish character uh, essay uh, from which I've given you the two excerpts, which I hope you have, and I want to pause over them. Because I think Adorno's essay, while perhaps a little quixotic, because after all, whoever could profit uh, from a concept of this kind, that Adorno's <coughs> essay is nevertheless rather brilliant in its distinction between the totality or wholeness that's offered to you by artistic form and the mere totalization or totalitarianism that's offered to you by modern hegemonic, he hegemonic forms of government, whether truly totalitarian or insidiously totalitarian, like, for example, the culture industry to which he devotes the essay that you've read. Um, so this is what Adorno says in these two passages. Um, he's talking about the way in which uh, people, uh, people in the culture industry uh, who appreciate music are completely victimized by the coloratura local effect, uh, what you might call, this is a, com a conductor whom Adorno hated, the Toscanini effect. Uh, that flourishing of a particular moment in a concerto, the writing it into the ground at the expense of the whole. Everything that has, everything that has uh, what Adorno elsewhere calls lip-smacking euphony. Uh, the sort of, in, a, in other words, a kind of cultivation of perfection of local sound as opposed to an awareness of the total composition. So he says in the first passage, the delight in the moment and the gay facade become an excuse for absolving the listener from the thought of the whole, whose claim is comprised in proper listening. The listener is converted along his line of least resistance, because after all it's so beautiful to listen to, uh, converted along his line of least resistance into the acquiescent purchaser. No longer do the partial moments serve as a critique of the whole, as they sometimes do in modernism. Dissonance, in other words, is in and of itself a critique of that overarching harmony with which we associate wholeness. Right? So there's a real sense in which the parts can be understood as a critique of the whole without challenging or breaking down the whole. Uh, no longer do the partial moments serve as a critique of the whole. Instead, they suspend the critique which the successful aesthetic totality exerts against the flawed one of society. In other words, nothing can criticize the inauthenticity of the bad totalities of society than the authenticity of a genuine achieved wholeness in a work of art. The difference between these senses of the whole is precisely the zone of critique which, in Adorno's view, might, just might, awaken the, uh, the victim of the culture industry uh, from the slumbers of happy conformism and acquiescence. 
Now, in the second passage, just to reinforce this, great modernist composers like Berg, Schoenberg, and Webern are called individualists by other Marxist critics, in other words, by people like Lukács, who don't like this sort of, you know, this, this, this what Lukács would call fetishization of form, reification of form at the expense of social reference and expression. And yet their work is nothing but a single dialogue with the powers that destroy individuality, powers whose formless shadows fall gigantically on their music. In music, too, collective powers are liquidating an individuality past saving, but against them only individuals are capable of consciously representing the, age, the aims of collectivity. In other words, uh, the the totality, the, the achieved, successful, authentic totality of the work of art models the totality of a collective state in ways that none of the false totalities of current hegemonies can possibly do or even approximate. In other words, there is an implicit politics in Adorno's argument in pure form, the achievement of pure form which is, after all, a collection of parts, is an implicit politics modeling the achievement of a collective society. Right. So that is the argument of Adorno. It's a fascinating one. As I say, it's perhaps somewhat quixotic because it's kind of hard to imagine anyone actually uh, sort of listening to Schoenberg and saying, gee, Maybe I should be a communist, you know. I mean, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, you know, this sort of actu actually putting this to work, in other words, uh, you know, entails, entails a certain amount of difficulty. Uh, but at the same time, I mean, intellectually, it seems to me to be a fascinating turn of thought and one that certainly does give one pause, uh, uh, if, if only because um, uh, Marxist criticism is so often engaged in a critique of what it takes to be the mainstream aesthetic of Western civilization, which is a kind of fetishization of wholeness. Think of the new criticism, the unity of the poem, the discrete ontological object as a unified whole. Uh, this is, of course, uh, commonplace uh, in being attacked by Marxist criticism, and it's very interesting to see in a figure like Adorno a champion of this very wholeness who, who, who sees it as a model not of uh, narcissistic individuality, but rather of collectivity. All right, and finally, uh, and I won't pause much over this because it's going to be the subject of Thursday's lecture, the last uh, option, for aesthetic option for Marxism, is a surprising one. And it actually goes back to a book by Ernst Bloch called The Principle of Hope. Uh, in which Bloch essentially argues uh, in uh, the world as we have it, um, in other words, the grinding down of hope, uh, uh, the, the, gr the grinding down of possibility uh, for all in late capitalism, there is no longer uh, any hope available, a kind of, a, a kind of gloomy uh, prognosis with which uh, Bloch um, uh, counters the idea that especially in folk art, folk ways, oral culture, uh, and in popular culture, uh, in other words, in the expressions of longing, one finds in the work of the dispossessed and the oppressed, there is a kind of utopianism, a romance, a sense not so much of wishing for something past, even though it, it seems to take the form of nostalgia, but rather a projection of a possibility on the future which is simply unavailable in the real world. Of course, the best example I can think of is the Big Rock Candy Mountain. Uh, you know, I mean, this is, sung, this, is, uh, this is a song sung by people on chain gangs uh, about, you know, liquor running down the sides of mountains and rivulets and, you know, everything just as it should be. Uh, the Big Rock Candy Mountain, in other words, is a perfect example of, um, a, of, of, of the principle of hope as uh, Ernst Bloch understands it. 
This is something that's picked up and taken very seriously by Frederick Jameson. Not so much in the excerpt from the political, con from the political unconscious that you'll be reading for the lecture, uh, but in an earlier part of that introductory chapter uh, in which he talks about the importance of romance uh, replacing the bankrupt aesthetic of realism, the aesthetic of realism that has been appropriated by the bourgeoisie, and as express expressing in a seemingly hopeless world uh, the hopes of the uh, oppressed and the dispossessed. Uh, so this too, the idea of romance, the idea of, the, of, of utopian evocation uh, is uh, a, a last viable aesthetic for um, a certain turn of Marxist thought which has been interesting uh, and productive in the 20th century. All right, so today we take up numbers two and three, the participatory aesthetic of Benjamin and the modernist totality of Adorno, uh, and we see the way in which they conflict with each other. Now, in some ways I wish we were still reading the fetish character essay because it has more to do with aesthetics than the excerpt you have in your book by Adorno and Horkheimer called The Culture Industry. But the culture industry, too, uh, is a response, as was the fetish character in music, which was published 1938, to Benjamin's work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction. Adorno, who was a close friend of Benjamin's and who exchanged letters about Benjamin's work of art essay with him, letters, by the way, which were republished in the New Left Review of 1973, those of you who are interested in looking at them because this is another source of, of ways of seeing how Benjamin uh, and Adorno were in conflict over this matter. Uh, Adorno and Benjamin, as I say, were uh, very close friends. Uh, Benjamin uh, was only for a relatively brief period in the 1930s a Marxist critic. Uh, he had hitherto been much more interested in uh, Kabbalistic literature, in the Hegelian tradition of philosophy, uh, and even in the 1930s he was famously torn uh, between two possibilities. He had visited Moscow in 1926-27, he had become interested in what was still, after all, as I've said, uh, a vibrant culture uh, in uh, the Soviet world, um, and at the same time he had become very close friends with the Marxist playwright Bertolt Brecht and uh, had fallen also very much under his influence. But another very close friend, a friend equally influential, was the uh, Jewish theologian Gershom Sholem, who had emigrated to Jerusalem, uh, who was a Zionist and who wanted Benjamin to join him uh, studying uh, the Torah <laughs> in Jerusalem uh, and to uh, engage himself in that community as opposed to the sort of international Marxist community uh, toward, which, toward which Benjamin was perhaps more leaning, especially uh, owing to his friendship with Brecht. So even in the 1930s, even in the period when Brecht wrote his work of art essay and also a shorter, even more tendentious essay called The Author as Producer, uh, 1936, uh, an essay in which um, he actually takes up at length something he mentions in passing in the work of art essay, that is to say the way in which uh, in Russia everybody is judged not just for being able to do a job but for being able to talk about doing a job, uh, for to be able to write it up, to describe it, to write a brochure about it, to write a letter to the paper about it, uh, in other words, to participate. Uh, to be engaged not just in the labor force but also in reflections on the labor force in a way that really does mean that everyone can be an author and also that every author is a producer, that is to say engaged in writing which is part and parcel of the productions of labor. Uh, all of this uh, was a focus of Benjamin, but at the same time 
even within this focus, uh, there, he, part of him is being torn in another direction. No one can, for a minute, in reading the work of art essay, fail to notice that Benjamin ev evinces tremendous nostalgia <laughs> for the aura. <laughs> it's not an easy thing for, or for Benjamin to say we have to tear down the aura and replace it with a kind of participatory, participatory mode uh, that uh, engages with and is involved in mechanical reproduction. I mean, I, mean I, I don't know. When I was a student, I worked uh, on and off, I did this for years, um, in an art supply and picture framing store uh, on the Berkeley campus. And uh, w of course, every student needed a picture to uh, put in his room. And so we had huge stacks of Van Gogh's sunflowers and uh, Matisse's dancers uh, and certain other uh, paintings, all of them 18 by 24, which we called brushstroke prints. They were, they were mounted on cardboard. Uh, and a huge whoom cookie cutter of some kind would come down on top of them, actually laminating into the print the appearance of brush strokes. Uh, and these things, if you squinted at the beginning of a semester, would you, you saw the stack going down like this. In other words, you, you, you know, and, and then before you knew it, the stacks were gone. And, and so you knew for a fact, because you knew how many prints were in that stack, that you know, 200 and 40 students' rooms were festooned with <laughs> Van Gogh's sunflowers, <laughs> <laughs> Matisse's dancers. And you said to yourself, this is the fruit of mechanical reproduction? You know, this, you know, and, and you ask yourself again, just, you know, just, just what is the value of this as an aesthetic? As, as an aesthetic? Yeah, it takes it out of the museum. Yeah, it means that nobody has to pay, um, you know, 50 bucks in order to stand, to, to wait in a long line in order to get a peep at the Mona Lisa. Yeah, you know, I mean, it really does bring it home to the people. But how and in what way and at the expense of what genuine knowledge of art history and even of Van Gogh and Matisse um, does the fetishization, because it is, after all, fetishization of these little mechanically reproduced brushstroke prints um, amount to. Obviously, this introduces complications, and their complications, the whole point of my anecdote, they're complications of which Benjamin is far from being unaware. He knows extremely well that, um, after all, the greatest threat to an aesthetic of the kind he profounds is that it can be commandeered by capital. Of course, I'm getting ahead of myself because that's precisely uh, what Adorno says in opposition to him. But in the meantime, that was the situation of Benjamin in the 1930s. Adorno, in the meantime, had gone to the United States. Benjamin was living in Paris ever since 1933. Adorno had gone to the United States, um, which he hated. I mean, the, the gloom of Adorno's view of the world is not so much the result of, the, of his experiences of that of the weak forms of democracy in the Weimar Republic, um, sort of ominous as those experiences were, not even perhaps so much the rise of Nazism, because like Benjamin, he was able to flee that. The gloom that he felt and the gloom that pervades his writing which, after all, starts in the mid-1940s, is the result of his exposure to American culture. <laughs> he simply could not stand us or our culture. Uh, he couldn't stand jazz. Remember, this was, this was not yet the age of bebop, and I've always felt that maybe if Adorno had hung around a little longer, he could have he been reconciled. It was, no, it, it, was, it was no longer the jazz of the aptly named director, the conductor Paul Whiteman, you know, it was it was you know it was it, it was jazz of of, 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 of of that was some more, somewhat more serious. He couldn't stand the movies. Um, I've just been I've just been for purposes I won't go into watching a film called uh, Broadway Melody of 1940 with Fred Astaire and Eleanor Powell tap dancing and Fred Astaire, you know, is sort of and 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 his sidekick George Murphy are sort of grabbed out of obscurity in order to be the leading gentleman of Eleanor Powell. It's a perfect sort of Samuel Smiles success story, replete with 
uh, the necessity of occasional self-sacrifice on the part of both of them. I mean, it is, it is made for the wrath of Adorno, this film. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, but it is, um, it is and, and it's nevertheless in ways that Adorno could not possibly ever uh, come to feel quite charming. Um, but, uh, but, but Adorno wanted no part of American culture, and he was uh, in anticipation of that whole trend of American sociology, uh, obsessed with um, the way in which. Uh, American society is dominated by conformism. He takes this to be the effect, the result of the pervasive, um, oppressive thumb of the culture industry, so that our very eccentricities, our very quirks and little originalities, all of them are assessed carefully by the culture industry, a niche is found for them, and the next thing you know, we're suborned, just like everybody else. There is, uh, in for Adorno, uh, no sideways escape from the uh, monolithic, uh, 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 ubiquitous surveillance uh, and dominance of the culture industry. All right, now the work of art uh, in the age of mechanical reproduction um, is influenced obviously by the promise of Russian art before 1934. The films of Vertov, uh, uh, in particular, uh, and other ways in which it's possible for Benjamin to say that the spectator really can be a participant. It's possible for Benjamin to say that in such contexts it's a good thing that the uh, pedestaling, the, 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 the pedestaled aura of the work of art uh, has been successfully torn down, that we no longer stand in rapturous attention uh, and in contemplative postures before works of art, but that we uh, reach out to them and they reach out to us. We meet halfway and we become engaged with them, we become part of them. Now how does this work in this essay? Primarily through the insertion of the labor function of the apparatus in the represented field. Now, this is uh, a complicated idea that Benjamin develops in various ways. But what he means by this is that the spectator sees the object, sees whatever the field in question is, from the perspective of the mode of production. That is to say that what the, the, perspective, the spectator participates by joining the process of production. Most obviously, this means that when I watch a film, I see the film necessarily, of course, from the standpoint of the camera eye. My eye, in other words, joins that of the camera. Very interesting that in Berlin in the 1930s, Christopher Isherwood in his Berlin stories uh, wrote one story uh, called I Am a Camera, taking place in Berlin. Uh, I've often thought there's some sort of symbiosis between the notion uh, I am a camera uh, in Christopher Isherwood and the way in which it may be appropriated or it may simply be a happy coincidence uh, in the work of Benjamin. But in a certain sense for Benjamin, the spectator, to be a participant, is the camera, is, in other words, the camera's eye. What is the consequence of this? Well, the spectator is, in a certain sense, then a critic. Benjamin keeps comparing the eye of the camera with a test. He even compares it with the vocational aptitude test. It's as though what in the theater would count as an audition I appear before the director, I recite certain lines of the script, and I'm either uh, told to come back another day or I'm given the part. What the, it, it, it's as though to substitute what counts as an audition with the perpetual audition of the film actor before the camera. Because after all, there's the camera recording what the film actor is doing. But the camera, not this camera up here by the way, but ordinarily the camera has the, op the option of later on throwing out what isn't any good. <laughs> Would that they could. Uh, but, 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 the, but, the, but the film camera can edit. The film camera is part of an editing process so that the actor in front of the camera is perpetually being tested 
auditioned in just the way that uh, you might be tested or auditioned if you took a vocational aptitude test for a job. That's Benjamin's point. And what he means to say is that if the spectator then takes the camera's eye position, the spectator, him or herself, then becomes a critic, like a sports fan. Benjamin doesn't pretend for a moment that to become a critic of this kind is to be a good critic. Not at all. Not at all. Benjamin agrees with people that we, th who say, well, we go to the movies when we're tired, all we want is to be entertained. In fact, we are distracted. We are critics, as Benjamin argues, in a state of distraction. The German word is Zerstreuung. We are Zerstreut. And we're perpetually, in other words, uh, not quite paying attention, even while at the same time we are seeing things from the camera eye point of view. To see things from the camera, I'll come back to distraction in a minute. To see things from the camera eye point of view is a position of privilege because it exposes, as Benjamin tells us again and again, things about reality that we wouldn't otherwise notice. The camera is capable of slow motion. It's capable of angles of incidence that we couldn't otherwise see. It's capable of all kinds of effects. Let me enumerate them. I think it's on page uh, 1235. Photographic reproduction, top of the left-hand column. Photographic reproduction with the aid of certain processes such as enlargement or slow motion can capture images which escape natural vision. Then on page 1245, he gives this process a name. He says, the camera introduces us to unconscious opti optics just as does psychoanalysis to unconscious impulses. In other words, the camera's eye point of view is a privileged perspective. It does show us things as they are, or perhaps if not as they are, at least it reminds us that things as we see them with the naked eye aren't necessarily as they are. I mean, it's not perhaps so much a, 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 a notion of privileging what the camera sees as real over against what I see. It's a question of the camera reminding us, demystifying our ideology in short, reminding us that things as we see them aren't necessarily the way things are. The camera too may have its bias. Slow motion is an obvious bias. Speed up is an obvious bias. But the speed at which we things see things may be a bias too. That's the point of the expo I mean, it's not that it's not that the psychoanalytic unconscious is 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 telling the truth. I mean, dreams are crazy, right? <laughs> That's the whole point of dreams. It's not that it's it, it, it's not that it's reality over against a mystified world seen in consciousness. It's a challenge to consciousness by the world evoked in the unconscious. Not a question of what's real and what isn't real. Well, it's the same with the camera's eye point of view. And it's all of this which awakens, in a certain sense, awakens the spectator from the complacency of supposing his or her own perspective to be the truth. At the same time, admittedly the spectator is, dis is distracted, self-stroy. Well, what then? The point is this. There's a kind of dialectic between distraction and shock which is crucial, Benjamin, Benjamin thinks, to a genuine uh, aesthetic revelation. Uh, perhaps the best analogy is with Saul on the road to Damascus. You know how the story goes. Saul's trotting along on his horse and you know, not paying a lot of attention. He's distracted, daydreaming, whatever, and whoop, all of a sudden he falls off his horse. Right? That's a shock. And it's such a shock that he's converted to Christianity and he stands up and he brushes himself off and his name is Paul. Right? He's, he, he's a completely different person. You know, as a result, and this couldn't have happened, in other words, if he hadn't been distracted. Right? That's Benjamin's point. Distraction is the atmosphere or medium in which the shock of revelation can take place. And that's the advantage of distraction. He gives a wonderful example of the way in which we do receive works of art in distraction. 
Even if ordinary, I mean, even if we're the kind of person who does pay a lot of attention when they go to the movies, you, they, and we, oh, that's not me, we say, nevertheless, there is one way in which all of us receive works of art in a state of distraction, and that's in our reception of architecture. We pass through architecture. I mean, I, I work in the British Art Center every day. I have long since ceased to pay any attention to the British Art Center as a building. Uh, I, I, I receive the British Art Center, in other words, in a state of distraction. But that doesn't mean that it's not part of my aesthetic experience. It does, however, show that the aesthetic and the, and, 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 and the, ways, in which, the ways in which we process the forms of the world can be assimilated in more than one kind of state of attention. Uh, it is uh, in one's bones, in a certain sense to receive architecture. And yet at the same time, uh, unless we are sort of tourists gaping in front of the Taj Mahal with a camera or something like that, and, 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 and Benjamin does take that into account, unless we are in that particular mode, we receive the forms of our dwellings in a state of what you might call constructive distraction. All of that goes into Benjamin's aesthetic of participation. Now, I am out of time. Uh, perhaps I've said just about as much about Adorno as I need to say, although admittedly I haven't said much about the culture industry essay. Uh, maybe I'll come back to that briefly uh, before launching into Jameson on Thursday. On Tuesday of next week we'll be talking about the new historicism, and then we'll bring Tony back uh, and we'll go through all these various perspectives that we will have been rehearsing uh, to see what we can do with them when we read Tony. It has to do with the way in which um, we are brought up short by the kind of criticism which argues that somehow standing behind uh, our conception of reality and our understanding of our place in the world, there is one form or another of the unconscious. Uh, we have uh, arguably uh, in this course in literary theory, first taken up notions of a linguistic uh, unconscious, or in any case, linguistic preconditioning, then taken up notions of a psychoanalytic unconscious, and now uh, in the very title of Jameson's book, from which we'll be considering an excerpt in the next lecture, uh, we have the notion of the political unconscious. There are other ways of effecting a social criticism of literature and art. Uh, from the right, uh, there's, the, there's an extraordinary book by Leo Strauss on Aristophanes, together with his great readings of the traditional texts of political philosophy. Uh, there is, of course, a very scribed to conscious as well as to unconscious uh, preconceptions about the world. In other words, if I know um, really to the core perfectly well that the moon is made of green cheese, uh, I can prove it. Uh, I have no doubt about it. It's not something that I'm unaware that I think. <laughs> then, of, and which, but at the same time, uh, if my opinion, my belief, my expression of fact uh, to the effect that the moon is, is made of green cheese um, can be uh, demystified as ideology, the question is, well, is it still ideology if I'm quite conscious <laughs> of knowing <laughs> that the moon is made of green cheese and prepared to defend my position? Uh, just as, um, as a kind of belated aristocrat, I might be prepared to defend the idea that hierarchy and privilege is appropriate in society, um, perfectly conscious that this is an unpopular idea, but nevertheless uh, fully committed to it and prepared to defend it. The question sometimes in Marxism is, is this strong liberal tradition of criticism, uh, particularly in the public sphere, in the journalism of the public sphere, uh, perhaps the most uh, notable proponent of a liberal uh, criticism of art undertaken from a social point of view is the work collected in Lionel Trilling's The, Literal, the Liberal Imagination. So there are options, but by far the most pervasive mode of social critique uh, in literary theory, 
and in the modern history of thinking about literature uh, remains the Marxist one. Our concern, because we are uh, as much as we can be in working through these materials, our concern is, of course, primarily with Marxist aesthetics. What are the options uh, for a Marxist critic um, in aesthetic terms? Uh, and, that's, uh, and that's, of course, uh, what we're going to be taking up uh, in a moment and also when we turn to uh, Frederick Jameson on Thursday. But in the meantime, as we get into social perspectives on literature and art, uh, you may ask yourself uh, out of idle curiosity or perhaps even peevishly, why Marx? Why so much Marx? Why is it Marx who seems to stand behind the idea that the social criticism of art is the best and most relevant way to approach this subject matter? Uh, well, it's because whatever the outcome of Marx's thought may have proven to be historically, it's nevertheless the case uh, to this day that the most devastating critique of existing ideas about things, of states of affairs that, uh, as it were, meander along without too much self-consciousness, remains the Marxist one, together perhaps with the Freudian one. And when uh, we turn to Jameson next time, we'll see that in both cases, and we'll be working a little bit with this today too when we turn to Benjamin, uh, we'll see that in both cases, time, what about Marx? Uh, I mean, I, I, I think I can take it for granted uh, in a course of this kind. Most of you have some familiarity with the history of ideas uh, and with Western culture. I think I can take it for granted that, w that, that most of you have some notion, just as you have some notion about Freud, uh, you have some notion of what Marx is all about, um, of particular importance for the kinds of criticism we undertake to read in this uh, moment of the course is, uh, of course, the idea of ideology. Uh, now ideology, in the writings of both Marx and Engels and in uh, all the, the sort of complex history uh, of the writings that have succeeded them, they were founders of discursivity uh, and there has been great debate within the Marxist tradition. Ideology is a term about which there has never been a wholehearted agreement. Primarily, the disagreement concerning ideology in this tradition has to do with whether or not uh, ideology ought properly to be, uh, to be a 